Hi, this is Inga Firm, and first of all, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar that's hosted by the Intraacoustics Academy. I am Inga Firm. I work in the NHS in England, and I'm based at a hospital in South London. Most of my clinical time is spent testing babies under four weeks corrected age for my sins, and I started to look and to use narrowband CE chirps about five years ago. What I want to cover today in this webinar is that I want to talk a little bit about existing traditional stimuli and their limitations before going on to give a brief overview of the CE chirp. After that, I want to talk about the findings from studies comparing responses evoked using traditional and CE chirp stimuli. I also want to talk about some recommendations and to touch on some additional features that are available on these systems that can help us. Now, the ABR is a true neurogenic potential which occurs within 10 milliseconds of a suitable auditory stimulus being presented. The components that, generated, that are generated, the peaks and troughs, they're very brief, so they're less than one millisecond in duration. And in order to resolve the components, we need a very brief stimulus. This ensures there is good neural synchrony, resulting in a well-defined ABR waveform. Narrowband stimuli have a longer duration, and this can smear the ABR, especially at the lower frequencies. So to go on to the traditional stimuli. So in the beginning, we had the click though now we have got quite a range of other stimuli that we can use. The standard click is a 100 microsecond pulse, which is a broadband stimulus that can evoke neural fiber firing across a wide range of frequencies. And so we expect a response with a large amplitude. However, when the wave that is generated by the click travels along the basilar membrane, it triggers areas that respond to different frequencies at slightly different times due to the tonotopic arrangement of the basilar membrane. This produces a temporal smearing of the response because the high frequency fibers are being triggered before those for the mid and the low frequencies. And what we get is an ABR that's in response to all the frequencies, though some components will contribute destructively rather than constructively. So this produces an ABR that is smaller and possibly not so well defined. Various people have been looking at ways to actually sharpen this response to try to provide a more accurate comparison of the thresholds that we obtain when we're testing using objective methods and those that we obtain using behavioral methods. One way of doing this is to use stacked ABR. And what happens is that all the responses are aligned from the different nerve fibers to produce the final response. I'm not going to go into detail about stacked ABR here, but you can find out more information in the literature. For example, if you look at James Hall's um, handbook. Today, I want to focus on some alternative stimuli, the CE chirp family. The CE chirp was developed by Klaus Abeling and Manny Don and they use the cochlear design as the basis of their modeling to compensate for temporal delays. How does it do this? Well, it does it by doing something that's quite simple, and of course it isn't. As the traveling wave takes longer to reach the area responsible for low frequency fiber firing, then the low frequencies are given a head start over the high frequencies. 
and this is the CE chirp. The result is that all the nerve fibers are triggered at the same time, so you have neural synchrony and the outcome is a larger ABR. Now if you want to see a demonstration of how the click and how the CE chirp trigger the nerve, please see the Intraacoustics website and the link is on the page on the presentation. So I've said that the response is larger, but how much larger is it when we compare the CE chirp to the traditional click? Well, various studies have looked at the ratios, and if you look at broadband chirps, then for adults, Klaus Abeling and his colleagues have found that it, the chirp is about 1.7 times larger, and Marloff and Hood found it's about 1.8 times larger. There have been a couple of groups who've looked at it in infants, Sabula et al. found that it was twice as large, whereas Stewart and Cobb found it was 1.4 times as large. The difference here may be just down to the design of the actual studies that were carried out. With my colleagues, um, Guy Lightfoot and John Stevens, I completed a similar study to compare narrowband CE chirps and tone pips or tone bursts, and we did this testing in infants. We found that the narrowband chirp amplitude at 4K, 2K and 1K is at least one and a half times the size of that with the tone pip. At 500 hertz, the difference wasn't quite so great, but it was about 1.3 and Rodriguez and Lewis have actually produced similar results. Okay, so what's the relationship between the narrowband CE chirp and the full bandwidth CE chirp? The broadband frequency range is from 350 to 11,300 Hz. Narrowband CE chirps are frequency specific versions of the CE chirp, so they're like the tone pip version of the chirp. The narrowband CE chirps are octave band limited chirp stimuli centered around 0.5, 1, 2, and 4 kilohertz. So, for example, 4 kilohertz has a frequency range of 2,800 to 4 to 5,600 hertz. And outside of this octave band, then the frequency bands on both sides are attenuated by more than 60 dB. The frequencies that contribute to each narrow band stimulus are arranged in the same way as in the broadband chirp. So the low frequencies are presented before the high frequencies. So if I just click here and look at 500, you can see that the lower frequencies are coming through and then the frequency slowly increases until the highest frequency within that band has been presented. So what does this look like when we're actually testing? Now this is an example from um, some of the babies that I've tested. On the left hand panel, you have got the results from 4 kilohertz tone pips and 4 kilohertz chirps. And you can see straight away that there is a difference in the amplitudes and that the results or the responses of the chirp are considerably larger and in the right hand panel, I've got the results from one kilohertz. And this is also very similar. Now, there is one other thing to note when we're looking at these responses, and that's to do with the latency of the wave five response. So if we look at the 45 dB NHL responses, 
you will see that wave 5 for the tone pip is actually coming in at about 12 milliseconds. For the chirp, it's coming in at about 9 milliseconds. The reason for this difference is that the onset of the chirp stimuli occurs before the start of the recording epoch, whereas the tone pip stimuli onset is at the start of the recording epoch. The chirp response latency, unlike the tone pip response latency, is largely unaffected by the stimulus frequency. This means that the wave 5 latencies for narrowband CE chirps are aligned for all the frequencies. And for somebody who's just starting out to look at doing ABRs, this can prove to be quite helpful rather than not being sure exactly where to expect the latencies of the tone pip um, frequencies. How does this translate to the actual test time? So we've seen so far that this translates, um, that we get a large response and we're expecting that hopefully we can reduce the time to do the testing. I want to just go through this and just do a little bit of maths for you. I want to assume that we're going to obtain a response with the same signal to noise ratio as we'd get with the tone pips. Now the signal to noise ratio varies as the number of sweeps are squared. If the response is 50% bigger, so about 1 times 1.5 times as large as we've seen for 4 kilohertz, for example, then we need 1 over 1.5 squared number of sweeps to obtain the same signal to noise ratio as that as we've used with the tone pips. So that's about 44% of the number of sweeps. If we collect 3000 sweeps for pure tones, this would mean we would only need to collect 1320 sweeps for chirps. This means we've more than halved the test time. In practice, what we'll actually encounter are that there are fewer inconclusive results, or we may get more done, certainly if there's a hearing loss present, then it's good to be able to move on swiftly to get more results to feed this information back to the parents. It could mean also that we could have shorter test time available. I'm a little bit more cautious on that point, even though I'm head of service, um, more because we're trying to make sure that the babies are settled. And if we cut the test time too much, then we may find the baby hasn't settled in the time period anyway. and using chirps or tone pips wouldn't matter in that case. In England, we have our guidance and the NHSP ABR guidance suggests that fewer sweeps are actually needed for CE chirps. Our recommendations are that if we're using tone pips, that we should be using usually about 3000 sweeps a minimum would be 2,000, though if there is a large response, we can relax that a bit more and we can look at 1,500 sweeps. The same sorts of figures for chirps are that usually we'd look at only 2,000 sweeps to start with. We could, as a minimum, use 1,500, but if there's a large response, we could do 1,000. And this happens more frequently. And what we actually find in practice, or I find in practice, that there are more sweeps or more um, runs I'm doing where I'm only needing to do 1,500 sweeps because the responses are that much larger. 
is there anything else? Well, as the res result is larger, the response amplitude is larger, then we're actually seeing the response at lower levels in 50% of the cases. And this is due to the improved neural synchrony. So this means that the NHL and EHL correction is 5 dB less than for tone pips. So you're testing at slightly quieter levels for the same dB EHL level. This also means that the 90% confidence limits are narrower, improving the precision of the estimated audiogram. Also, for the same EHL, we need 5 dB less noise when we're masking. And this can make quite a bit of difference if we've got a unilateral loss, as babies become quite unsettled when sometimes the masking noise is having to be increased in the better ear. We also find that wave one is often clearer, and this is useful in two-channel um, bone conductor testing. And I'm going to expand a little bit more on this in a moment. In England, we have got the masking noise calculator that's been developed by Guy Lightfoot to give us an idea about how much masking noise we actually need. And this calculator also includes um, the figures for the narrowband CE chirps. One other thing is that narrowband CE chirps is also available as an ASSR stimuli. So, coming back to wave one, when there is a unilateral loss or an asymmetrical loss, ear specific information is needed. And we have three methods available to actually help us acquire this information about the ear specific sensitivity. The first is that we can mask the non test ear, which on the whole is something that we would aim to do, but is not always that easy when you're testing babies. The second is to use two channel recording, so where you're comparing the wave five amplitude and latency in the ipsilateral and contralateral channels. And then the last method is looking for the presence of wave one. Now these last two methods using the two channel recording or looking for wave one presence, it will confirm that the response is from the stimulated ear, but in cases of cross hearing, masking will still be needed. So what we've done is we've looked back at all the data that we've acquired from all the earlier studies that we carried out comparing tone pips and chirps in newborns. And what we found was that when we looked for wave one, wave one was present both in the tone pips, whoops, sorry, I was trying to do the pointer and it's not working. Um, wave one was found in both the tone pips and in the chirps at low sensation levels. However, what we found though, was when we look back through all the data, that it was seen much more frequently when we were looking at the waveforms evoked using chirps than for those evoked using tone pips. And the information I'm provided on the screen is from a sensation level of 10 dB, which is at a very quiet level. And you can see um, how often we're getting those responses. So what this means is that Wave one is seen frequently at low sensation levels, especially using chirps. And this can help us determine ear specific information when masking proves difficult. So I've been talking about all the pros 
as far as chirps are concerned. What are the limitations? Well, the advantage is less when you're using higher levels as the CE chirp is designed to give an optimal response around particular levels. However, it's not a full disadvantage because recruitment will actually help and also at the moment level specific CE chirps are being introduced. A further limitation is that there are no stedi studies at the moment on frequency specific features. But the limiting factor with all this is going to be the cochlea because damaged hair cells have flatter tuning curves so are less frequency specific anyway. CE chirps are not available on all ABR systems. At the moment they're available on the Intraacoustics Eclipse system and on the GSI or DERA system. There are other chirps but these non-CE chirps may not afford the same advantages and also they might not have the calibration references available. So what are the recommendations? Well, following on from the studies, the English NHSP guidance now includes information on the use of CE chirps. It's included also in the database that we use for the newborn hearing screening, um, the ESP system, and in that we can put our data in from the results of all the tests that we do, whether using tone pips or using chirps, and automatically it will come up with the appropriate NHL to EHL corrections. Our recommendation is that we are to use chirps if they are available. However, if ANSD is suspected, then the advice is to revert to clicks. And that is the same as if we were using um, tone pips as well. So just moving on from um, talking about chirps, I want to just say about some other features that are available um, in some of the ABR systems that are out there. And some of these features we can use and that can actually help us with the interpretation and with the testing, letting us know, giving us a better idea of when we should actually stop or accept what, um, what we're seeing on the screen. The first of these objective measures is FM, FSP or FMP. And this is, these are measures of the response quality and it's based on the F statistic. So FSP is the F statistic at a single point and FMP is an extension of this and is the F statistic at multiple points. And this is something that's available, FMP is available on the Eclipse. This can help support the presence of a clear response once all the other criteria that we need to be looking at have been met. The figures that we use in England to help support the presence of um, a response is if it's above 2.5 for earlier versions of the Eclipse software, then that will support our findings or if it's above a figure of 7 if it's for the more recent versions of the Eclipse software. Another objective measure is residual noise. Some systems will report how much residual noise is still in the waveforms that we've accepted. Residual noise can be used to help support as say when a response is absent after all the other criteria 
have been um, met. So for, for us in the UK, again, we'd be looking at a figure of less than or equal to 25 nanovolts for older software for the Eclipse and a figure of less than or equal to 15 nanovolts if we're looking at the more recent versions. Again, in England, the NHSP have recommended that we can use these objective measures when they're available to help us with our interpretation and with our test strategy. Something else which is available is something called Bayesian averaging. Bayesian averaging allows us to adopt a more lax artifact rejection level. What is it? Well, if I talk about what happens with the eclipse, in the eclipse, the response updates every 100 sweeps. For each of those sweeps, the residual noise is measured. Each block is then weighted and then the final average computed is from all the weighted blocks. The advantage of this is that noisy periods have less destructive effects and the average is dominated by periods of low noise. Disadvantages, or I'd probably again say limitations, that there's no benefit if the noise is similar in each of the blocks. So for instance, when the baby is sleeping. Also, if there's regular noise like heartbeat, this is not rejected. However, using Bayesian averaging still is not a, a disadvantage it's just not going to have an effect. So again, in England, the recommendation is if you've got Bayesian averaging available, it is to use it. And just to go on for a moment, just to explain a little bit more about the effects of which artifact rejection level that you're using and if you've got Bayesian averaging switched on or off, I want to just talk through briefly about a study that was completed by Guy Lightfoot and John Stevens. Oops. What they did was that they have they've got the recordings from about a hundred babies available, and so they did a study using different artifact rejection levels. The ones that they used without Bayesian averaging were plus and minus 5 microvolts, plus and minus 6, plus and minus 8, plus and minus 10, and plus and minus 20 microvolts. They then also repeated the studies using an artifact rejection level of plus and minus 10 and plus and minus 20 but this time with Bayesian averaging switched on. Now this first example that I've showed, you can see that as expected, with a sleeping baby with very, very low noise, the strict artifact rejection level of plus and minus five gives the lowest um, amount of noise present in the trace and we get the best um, signal to noise ratio coming out. If you then compare that to with plus and minus 10 without Bayesian averaging to that with Bayesian averaging, you can see that it is much better once we've used Bayesian averaging, even with these more lax artifact rejection levels. And in fact, 
with plus and minus 10 with Bayesian averaging, it's not that much worse a response than if you'd actually used uh, plus and minus 5 without Bayesian averaging. So, what happens when we have a moderate level of noise? Well, in this case, you can see that plus and minus 5 is no longer the best option, but in fact, to use plus and minus uh, 6.5 or plus and minus 7 is much better. It actually pays to let more noise in, and this works because fewer sweeps are being rejected, but really noisy sweeps are still being kept out. However, even better is to use plus and minus 10 with Bayesian averaging. Right, what about in the worst scenario, the one where the baby is just not settled enough, and uh, but you've still got to get some testing completed. Well, without Bayesian averaging, you certainly don't want to be using plus and minus five, because very few sweeps are actually being accepted. And you don't want to be using plus and minus 20, because now lots of noise is being accepted. So in this situation, the best is probably about plus and minus 8 microvolts. But if you've got Bayesian averaging, forget that. Just go straight to plus and minus 10 with Bayesian averaging. And that has given us the best result in any of the situations overall. Now, I'm coming to the end of my talk. For those of you who don't routinely use CE chirps, I am hoping this talk will make you think about starting to use them if they are available, and also to look at some of those other features that I've just mentioned as well. I would like to thank Intracoustics for the opportunity to talk today about chirps. I also want to thank Guy Lightfoot for his input and also for the use of many of his slides. And also I'd like to thank you all for listening. That's me finished. So if anyone has got any questions, then please ask them now and I will try to answer them. Okay, Johannes has, has um, written, great presentation, thank you. How is your experience with bone testing using chirps and with newborns? Well, as I use chirps nearly all the time now, and I see lots of babies with conductive losses, um, I see a few, of course, with permanent losses, I just do the same testing and I'm getting the same results as I've got um, with using air conduction. I have put this out as a presentation, as a poster. Um, I think it was in Busan last year, but um, I haven't actually written up the results or published them as yet, but they're out there and we're getting the same results coming through as we've done with the air conduction. So it does make it, um, it's a lot easier to see because the response is larger. I hope that answers your question. Okay, if no one has got any other questions, then again, I'd like to thank everybody one more time and let you get back to the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.